reading this morning comes from Luke's Gospel. It's often called the prodigal son, or sometimes it's called the prodigal and his brother. But really, I think this is the parable of the loving father. It may be, it's probably the best known of all the parables told by Jesus. And for many people, this is one of their favorite stories in the whole Bible. Now, sometimes it can be hard for us to hear familiar stories again and again. But a heartfelt, I love you, cannot be said too often. Listen now for God's loving word to all of us. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners, eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that will belong to me. And so he divided the property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he'd spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Fathers, I've sinned before heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command, and yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back and he's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? And the father said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost, and it has been found. Here ends our reading. Thanks be to God.
Will you pray with me? Dear God, your loving, living word comes to each one of us this day. In some ways, we're each lost, longing to be found, searching for our place in your family. We are all, we are each your adopted children, beloved. Help us to find our way closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know if uh, you've ever wondered what the view is like from up here, what I get to see every week. Uh, all right, geez, okay. Uh, got to your picture, you know. Uh, wish I could put it up larger against the, the wall here, but, uh, you know, you can see oh, most of the eyes are open. A couple of people say, oh, it's sermon time. Ooh, the eyes are closing, uh, you know. I can uh, describe what's here in this image. There's you know, light coming through the window. We could count numbers of people. There's you know, room, up, room up front. But looking at this picture, I mean, we can describe what's right here in, in this snapshot. But what's going to happen next? Everybody going to go to sleep? Uh, you know, uh, what, what will come you know, a half hour from now? Or what? What did this look like a half hour before or a week before? We really don't know. We get this, we can, we can describe what is, what is right here in this moment, but what's coming down the road is still to be discovered. It is an unknown for us. The morning reading this morning, our passage from Luke, in it, Jesus takes a picture for us, but he, he does it with words. This parable that we've been given captures a moment for us that is just permeated with grace. It is overflowing. It's as if heaven and earth touch for a minute, for just a moment, and we're given a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is like if we had just a few seconds to look at it. And, uh, and if we have um, folks who travel, if you've been to state parks or those places with the big old telescopes where you can put a quarter in and it goes for a little bit and you've got just a few minutes to, to look around, to see across uh, the valley um, you, and then it goes, your time's up and uh, you know, the shutter drops. You have to pull out another quarter or you say, okay, that's all I get. You know, I, got my, I got my glimpse through that, through that telescope. And Jesus, I think, is giving us something like that with our story this morning, this glimpse of what the kingdom is like, and in it, it might strike us as being uh, some familiar landscape or being a very human situation. We don't have to look at this story very hard or for very long to realize that there is a very human family that's being shown with all of the joys, frustrations, and dysfunctions that we can find in family life. Jesus starts the story by saying, there's a father who had two sons, and the first son says, Dad, drop dead. You know, I'd like to have my portion of what's coming to me. Uh, the, the stuff that I'll get after you die, I don't want to wait that long. Um, I've got to get on with my life. I've got people to see, places to go, wild oats to sow. Um, pretty amazing and brazen request. And I don't think that it would go over all too well in many families at all. Haven't thought to try that one. Uh, I don't know, but no. Uh, you know, what's more brazen or more hard to accept for us is to even imagine a father, an earthly father. But here Jesus is painting this picture where the person, the father, says, it's okay. All right? I accept your view of the world. I accept your rejection of me. I wish things were different. I love you. I'll let you go with everything in the world that I have. Here, take it. Farewell, my son. Now, how many earthly dads really would do that? And Jesus is pointing how God is willing to endure our rejection, our turning our backs, 
are heading out with the gifts that we've been given to who knows where. The younger son takes off. And, and we know what, what happens then. Uh, there's a story that kind of fun to tell about a youngster in Sunday school who uh, was responding to the question, of, well, what happened to the younger son as he went off to that far country? And I hope it was unknowing, but uh, this young lad responded, well, yeah, the, the younger son, uh, he went into town and he spent half of his money on women and wine and then he wasted the rest. The son got as far away as possible from everything that was his former life. And for a moment, things seemed great. And then things got really desperate. He ran out of money. He ran out of food. Things were scarce now. Times were hard that even the pig slop started to look good to him. And the story said, a moment came when he came to himself. Like Max in the story, smelled something from all the way around the world, and he wanted to go home. Something in him clicked, something changed, and he said he wanted to go back home. We don't know what it was within him, or how deep this conversion was, or just how sincere he was going to be when he got back home to offer his apology, but we know that he turned around, and he headed back. He went back to start some kind of new relationship with someone that he had treated as good as dead. Now, he wouldn't have expected that things were going to be the same. He didn't hope to go back and say, oh, Pop, forget all that I said and what I, what I did. Uh, can we just have a do-over? No, he knew that wasn't going to happen again. But by turning around, he said, well, I could start something new. I can start something over. Uh, he had an idea what that might be. He had hoped that maybe he could be a laborer on his dad's farm. He knew this farm already, so he had some experience perhaps he could offer. And in our glimpse, we see that he is welcomed back. And more than, sure, okay, you can get to work, I'll, I'll pay you. A grand party is thrown for him. There's music that begins to play. He's back in the door, but what's going to happen? Will it work out? Will it last? We know that this picture, the snapshot, couldn't have happened at all if it wasn't for the younger son turning around and looking for something new. The story touches on repentance. And the question is always before us, what does it mean to repent? How do you know it? How do you feel it? How do you do it? When we speak of repentance, I really like the idea of going in a new direction or turning around. And the, the younger son literally does this. He'd gone off to a far country. You know, he bolted from home, took off on his own down a dusty road, spent all that he had, and, and then he turned around to come back home to the place that he had left. He was now moving in the right direction toward love, Love that was willing to let him go in the first place and set him free. He was going to go back to see what love would do with him then. For him, repentance was going to be to go to that man he said was as good as dead, who was his father, and say, Father, once again. Repentance for him would be to claim his role as son in a family that he had turned his back on and left behind. To acknowledge his part in breaking things apart. For him, a new direction was to know and to accept that he was loved unconditionally. And then he had to figure out how to live knowing that he was still just as free as he was before. He came home, and he could leave again. He'd been lost. He could be lost again. This was just the beginning of a new direction for him. If things were going to change, things are going to have to change. He was going to have to change. And it might be too all too easy to go back to thinking and acting like he did, right back to the wild rumpus. Family is a place that if you knock on the door, uh, they have to let you in. And he was let back in, and we don't know what was next for him or what would come for the whole family, but we do know 
what was right now. And right now, he's love. The father was hoping for, he was anticipating this return, and his generous actions assure us of this. Dad had been waiting, hoping, longing that the younger son might return, that somehow things could change. And one day it does. We see the father rushing out, running out to greet the son. That'd be really undignified for an elderly statesman in that day to go rushing down the road. But he does. Welcoming his son home with, with no question as to where he'd been, what he'd been up to. There's no scolding, no punishment, no penance that's issued. The love comes first. It had always been there. And now the father can hold the one that was lost and gone. Now he's come home. Now the older brother is in need of repentance as well. He's lost in a completely different way. The one who had tried to do everything right, who never learned to party. Presbyterians identify with his older brother so much. Um, yeah. We're going to play by the rules. We are, you know, book of order. We are going to do our duty and get it done. He's lost also. Lost, thinking that his father's love should be conditional, that it ought to come with strings attached. Only after certain conditions are met, then, okay, then you can get a dollop of love. The older one would dutifully do what needed to be done in order to keep things going, but he did it with a sense of resentment. The relations between the older brother and the younger brother were obviously strained. The way the dad was treating the younger brother just drove the older brother nuts. The older one couldn't make sense of his dad. He broke all the rules. Hey, what are you doing? With this no good brother of his, now to repent for the older brother would be to call his brother, brother, again to find a way to sit at the table of celebration with him. And at the end of the story, he's not there yet. He can only call the prodigal his father's son. He can't even say, my brother has come back. Dad, your boy has come back, and you treat him like this. So the older brother standing outside, just kind of watching all of this happen in the house. And to repent, for him to turn around for him to start walking a new road, to claim a new direction. He's going to have to deal with his dad, who could love somebody else like that, who might even love him just like that. One who could love that no good brother and love him just as much and understand that dad doesn't run out of love, no matter how he spills it for the family. Jesus paints this picture. A loving parent who goes out to meet the younger one on the road off a chance to come on home. And he also goes out to the older one to say, hey, come on in. You're home as well. What's mine is yours. The offer to each one is, it's real. It's for each one of us. It's more than a call to come home. It is a call to conversion, to cast off any smugness we might have, any false righteousness we might be burdened with. It is a setting aside of prejudice so that something can begin anew. Each of the brothers, younger and older, has the invitation to change. The pictures that follow, the story of what happens next, that's up to us. We can see in this instant an entirely different way of being God's family. It's appealing in one way, and it's appalling in another way, at least maybe to our common sense. Uh, most likely we could identify with one or the other of the brothers, perhaps the younger. Maybe we've lived a little bit harder than we would have liked to have, looking back, or maybe we can resonate with the older brother, feeling that somehow uh, life has shorted us out of what we're due, or that joy that uh, should be coming from the faithful work that we've done. There's a party going on. Things can't be like that. Really? We don't know whether the younger brother has changed for good. And we don't know if the older brother ever lightened up and came in to join the party. But every time, 
Somebody comes back home, drawing closer to God truly, God will celebrate. It's true for you and for me, this day and always. Amen.